It's time to get started with our Wednesday evening services. We know we're always blessed for being here and uh, we're grateful for this opportunity to be here. We have uh, some that need to be remembered in prayer. Bob York was taken to the emergency room today, but he's back home and I think he was dehydrated and just needs some rest. Uh, Sonny Rommelman's brother-in-law, Roy Scott, needs your prayers as he is facing some serious health issues. Roger Thompson of our Christian Counseling Center has been having some health issues over the past few weeks and could really use our prayers. Tom Rees has been moved back to the Calvert City Convalescent Center. Please remember him in your prayers and consider calling or stopping in for a visit. Jeff Hall a deacon of the Calvert City Church of Christ and husband to Cheryl Hall, one of the kids' first teachers and cousin of, to Brad, was admitted to Baptist Health with a severe infection and complications due to cancer treatment. He should be going home today. Prayers with our cards will also be appreciated. You can uh, leave those in the preschool cubbies that his wife can pick up if you would like to do that. Chester Uzzle has not been able to come to services for the past few weeks due to health reasons. He needs your prayers and also cards of encouragement. His address is 182 Edwards Lane in Benton. Don Frick and Mary Rowe will be traveling to Fayette, North Carolina this next Tuesday, October the 9th, to help with the disaster caused by the flooding. They will be working with the Area Church of Christ in the, there, and if you would like to go see Don Frick, we need to keep this group in our prayers. Also remember the elders' prayer list and daily updates. Some announcements. Tomorrow, October the 4th, is National Take a Bible to School Day. We encourage all students to participate by taking their Bible to school tomorrow. Attention seniors. The Young and Heart is invited for a day of fun and fellowship on Tuesday, October the 9th. The bus will leave the church at 9 a.m. and return by mid-afternoon. We will be stopping at Columbus Belmont Park and then travel on to Real Foot Lake where we will have lunch at the Fish House. Sign-up sheet is on the bulletin board. See Bob or Gene Hines for information. The congregation is invited to attend the wedding of Bryce Rudd and Raina Glyce on October 27th. RSVP information is on the bulletin board in the foyer. Uh, pick up a list of the addresses of our college students in the foyer. They would appreciate hearing from you. And our last one for the youth, October 12th is the last day to sign up for the ERUP Youth Rally which is on October 26th. After a prayer, Jim Kelly will be uh, our song leader and uh, our speaker tonight is from Okeechobee, Florida. Uh, I think you'll notice him whenever he comes up. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're so grateful for all that you do for us, and we pray, Father, that we have thanked you this day for the blessings that you give us. We realize, Father, that we are blessed, and one of the blessings, main blessings we have, Father, is being in Christ and being here with our fellow Christians. We realize the strength that it gives us, Father, for having this midweek service, that we can pause from our other weekly activities, and we can be here with here to worship you, Father, and to open your word, and hopefully, Father, that we can get something that will help us to be stronger and help us to meet the challenges that we face, face in our lives. We pray that you'll be with all those involved tonight in leading this worship and all those that are teaching tonight. We're so thankful, Father, for their dedication and for their willingness to do what they do. And again, Father, we're grateful for this church and ask you to continue to bless it. Through your son's name we pray. And amen. Four hundred sixty-nine. There for a moment, I thought we were going to have a guest speaker. Four 
Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the falling bells below, let all our strength be heard. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory. Faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love. Our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph rock. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath, swept on or every field. Through faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is our victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, my brave and shall begin, before the angels he shall know. His name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory. Faith Song of Encouragement 907. I don't know if it's possible to have dual membership in two churches, but thank you, Don, for that introduction. I want to share with you tonight uh, three things that God doesn't know. In the interest of full disclosure, these, these three thoughts are, are not mine. Again, uh, last uh, one Sunday night in Okeechobee, we've got a preacher that comes down every time, preacher from Eastern Kentucky. And uh, they asked him to preach a very godly man, a wonderful preacher and a good man. And uh, when he made that statement, I'm pretty sure that we all looked at him similar to the way y'all looking at me right now when he said there's three things that God doesn't know. He took 45 minutes to do that, and I've got less than five now, so y'all hold on, I'm gonna take off. Number one, God does not know a sin that he does not hate. God does not know a sin that he does not hate. Sin is defined as anything contrary to the will and the word of God. We've got to understand because God is so pure and holy and righteous that it is literally impossible for sin to coexist with him. In Genesis 3, when man sinned, was disobedient to God and, and sinned, uh, he was driven out of the garden, of course, but the relationship between God and man changed forever at that moment. If you, if you want to, you can turn to Proverbs 6. I'm going to read just uh, four verses there. Proverbs 6, 16 says, There are six things which God hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Abomination is something that is so repulsive that you just you can't stand it. It's kind of like boiled okra to me, only in a lesser. But anyway, there are seven things that are an abomination to God. Verse 17, Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood a heart that devises, devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, 
and anyone who spreads strife among the brethren. Now this list obviously is not all inclusive of the sins that God hates, but it makes the point that sin cannot be tolerated by God. Number two, God does not know a sinner that he does not love. I wish I had 45 minutes just to do this topic here. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And what is the best known, most quoted verse in the Bible? John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Then John 15, verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one would lay down his life for his friends. 1 John 3, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. So the, the love of God... I. I don't think I'm the only one in this auditorium that really struggles getting my head around that kind of love. It just, it's, it's hard for me to understand. Number three, the third thing that God does not know. He does not know a sinner that he will not save. Now let that sink in a minute. We got to understand and we got to accept the fact that we're all sinners, everybody in this auditorium. Either that or 1 John is untrue. And it's inspired, so it's true. We're all sinners. Uh, we've all come short of the uh, glory of God, according to 1 John uh, 1, 8 and 10. 1 John 1, 9, in the middle of that, he says, but if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all our sins and uh, unrighteousness. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. I can't find any. If y'all if know of one, please come to me after service and tell me, but I haven't found an example yet in the Bible where someone came to God in humble obedience, asking for his love, asking for his forgiveness, and asking for his saving grace, and was turned away. If you find that, let me know, because I'd like to know where it's at. On Pentecost in Acts 2, I've thought about that a lot, and I know, I know we, preach, we preach that a lot, but I, I'm confident that some of the people in that crowd that Peter preached to were there when Pilate asked a question, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they screamed, crucify him crucify him. Probably some of those people were standing there when Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross and watched him die that horrible death. But Jesus promised Peter that I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And that day, Peter used those keys to unlock salvation for everybody in that crowd and everybody in this auditorium. That's another thing that's difficult for us to understand. And I, we don't need to compare bad conduct with anything, but I read that and I think of all the things that those people did to our Savior. And if they had a chance at salvation, I've got a chance. I've done some things that I'm certainly not proud of, and I'm sure we all are, all have. And we all struggle with sin every day. Y'all, I was privileged to serve this congregation for 14 years as an elder, and I'm going to tell you, it doesn't end. The struggles doesn't end. Those of you that have served in that capacity or currently serving will tell you, in fact, many of them are, in, are enhanced. We all struggle with sin. We all struggle with problems in life. But from Genesis 3 that I quoted earlier, God had a plan in place to save mankind, and it was through his son Jesus in obedience to him. Every time this church meets, we have an opportunity for anybody in the auditorium uh, or anybody listening to come and uh, confess their sin, to be baptized into Christ. There's a lot of people out there in the world that will tell you how to be saved. 
it really doesn't matter what they say or what I say. What matters is what God said because God makes the rules and God will do the judging. And God said through Peter, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's what we must do to be saved. And God is there for those of us that have done that and are struggling. A lot of people are struggling today, and I know that. And uh, that's what this church is about. We reach out to one another. I hope if you have any need that you'll respond this evening as the elders come forward to help you as we stand and sing. Dismissed to the class.
All right, let's run in our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is a passage where Solomon quotes the birds from, um, what, the 1950s? How old is that song? Is it the 1950s or 1960s? 60s, 60s. yes. We're not that old. 60s, the birds, 1960s. You know nothing about those things that late. All right. Doug, did you ever go see the birds? You saw the birds on TV? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, who do we need to have on our list as far as checking on and praying for? As mentioned, Tom Reeves is now back over in Calvert City at the uh, Convalescent Center out there. Uh, Bob this morning wasn't feeling very good, spent some time in the hospital, was told to go home and rest. That's Bob York. Who else? Do we know of anybody else? Very good. All right. Usually about fall time is when we start hitting a little bit more of your flu and some people start not feeling quite as good. So that's good. It's still warm, isn't it? So we're not there. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. We're going to start Father in heaven, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to get together and to study your word tonight. Father, we pray that as we study, we may not only learn about your word, but we pray that we may apply it to our lives as well. We pray that you be with Bob York. And we pray that you be with him as he rests and recover. We pray that you be with Anne as well. And Father, we pray that you be with Tom. And we pray that you'll continue to bless him and his children as he prepares to move. Father, we thank you for this church. We're thankful for each and every member of it. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to be together and to dwell in your name. Father, we pray your blessings upon us. We're so thankful for your grace, your mercy, and your son. And it's in your son's name we pray. And amen. All right. Now, as you get into Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we enter into, I always just called it the song. It may be my favorite part of Ecclesiastes because I'm aware of the birds and, you know, the song that they sing. You know, there's always a season, turn, 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 and they go through all those words. Well, as you look through it, it's talking about balance. And, of course, there's a lot of different ways in which this book is put, or this chapter is put together. But what you see is 14 opposites. It's put in a, a certain way. Each verse will repeat two things in a different way. We'll talk about that as we go through. But remember, Solomon is a wise man. And so, in much of his poetry, he's going beyond just the words. He's going back to the symbolism of how he's putting it to teach us an even greater lesson. So, as we get started, notice the word time. How many times does time appear in the chapter? Should be 31. What do our notes say? 31, good. All right. 31 times it's mentioned. Now, we know that God has no time. Time is not something he deals with. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning of the end, the one who was, who is, and who is to come, the Lord God Almighty. He is eternal. And so imagine with me, if you will, what it would be like to be eternal. There is no time. So for God, yesterday and today is the same day because there's no tomorrow. It, it's all the same. So it's a really fascinating concept as we try to break apart what it would be like to not have time. Because time is what constrains every one of us, isn't it? We're going to be in here until when? 7.30, right? And if I go 10 minutes over, that's really bad, right? If I go 10 minutes short, hopefully that's not good. Hopefully that wouldn't excite you too much, right? But in our minds, there's a clock. 7.30 is when that's got to be. Uh, we go tomorrow, school, work. There's a certain time that you have to be there. And whether it's 6 or 7 or 8 or 9. And so we, we are very ingrained. Okay, this is when I go to bed. This is when I go up. This is when I eat lunch. This is when this happens. This is when, you know, whatever show you like to watch. This is when the Kardashians come on, right? I'm sure we got a lot of Kardashian fans. Um, and so, you know, we are really stuck into time. Now, going beyond our clocks, we're stuck into time as far as calendars. 
You know, you've had a birthday coming up. You have been on this earth for, you know, 60 years or 50 years or 20 years. You are looking forward to this anniversary or that anniversary. Everything has to do with time. Now, in many ways, time is good, right? In some ways, time is bad. What are some ways in which time is bad? When you're late for work, when you're late for work. yeah. When it's wasted, okay, a moment wasted can never be getting, gotten back, right? Can never be earned back. That's true. Time is bad. When we go out and we look at a gravestone and we see a loved one and you see the date, you know, 2008 or 2010, you know, that's when it ended, their walk upon the earth and now they're in eternity. And that, that's not a good, positive thing. Now, as you go through the early parts of Genesis, God makes time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He made light. He made night. He made light and day. He created the days. Then he created sun, moon, and stars. And so he created the calendar. He created time. And we see twice in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, twice after he's created those things, he says it is good. But there's sometimes when time is not good. It's interesting when you go before Genesis 6 and look how long all these people lived, right? Who lived the longest? Methuselah. He died the year of the flood. Kind of interesting when you think about that. Was he an evil man that just lived a long time? Or did he happen to die in January or February and maybe the flood was later in the year? He's the longest lived person. Now Noah lived 600 years, but what happened after Noah as far as time that people lived? Much, much less. God began looking upon man and he saw that many times when they lived a longer time, they tended to turn more selfish, more evil, and turn against him. And so it appears there about Genesis 10, after Noah and his ark, that people lived a shorter amount of time. Was that because the atmosphere changed? Perhaps. Was that because of, you know, something God did? Perhaps it was. But we see that time... After Abraham, who lived 120 years, time has become shorter as far as today. Now we're impressed if we live 90 years or 100 years. That's an impressive long life for many of us. But as you and I think about time, we look at our lives and we think, okay, where are we as far as our life projection? Probably most of us in here have reached the halfway point, right? Not everybody, but many of us probably have reached the halfway point. And so you look back, and as we said before, sometimes time's wasted. You know, when we were young and able to do things and go to school or whatever, maybe we use that time wisely. Maybe we didn't use it quite as wisely as, as we could. Now we look in the future, and the future, of course, is uncertain because we don't know what it holds. So time is an interesting thing to grasp and to think about. And so as we've read through Ecclesiastes, we've seen how everything is vanity, a grasping after the wind. You can feel it as it goes through your fingers, but you just can't quite hold on to it. And that's what Solomon's talking about as he opens this, this uh, point of Ecclesiastes up and goes back to this song. Now, I opened up that first paragraph talking about balance. What are some things that we need to have balanced in life? Oh, your checkbook. He's young. He doesn't know. All right, checkbook. All right. It's good to balance your checkbook. All right. How about your diet? Things that you eat. Ice cream every day, not very good. Right? Well, it's good, but the effects of it's not so good. All right. Uh, the friends you're around. Okay. Leisure versus business. You know some people who work too much. Yes. You know, some people have too much leisure, probably, right? And so every aspect of our life needs balance, and you'll see that as we go through and we look at this and see how it works. Okay, so to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And so now we get started, okay? Each, uh, each uh, phrase is a duplet, and then the, the two phrases and two phrases are also duplets, okay? So... In each verse, you're going to see four things that are related in some way as we go through. All right, verse 2. There's a time to be born and a time to die, 
a time to plant and a time to pluck whatever it is that's planted. All right, so what's he talking about here? Time to be born and time to die. We had something pretty cool happen last year at our congregation. How many babies did we have born? It was about five, wasn't it? Okay. The teacher is supposed to never ask a question you don't know the answer to, but I think it was five babies that we had. All right. So we had five babies. Yet last year was a year of babies. This year is a year of marriages. Everybody seems to be getting married this year, right? Okay. It's interesting to see how we go through those sort of phases. Sometimes we'll have a lot of funerals, one after the other. Sometimes, boy, you know, we'll fill up that nursery in a year. Sometimes um, it seems like everybody's getting married. Sometimes everybody moves away. Sometimes everybody moves here. All right. There's a time in our life in which we're born. That's right there in that gravestone. And there's a time in our life in which we will die. Unless the Lord comes back, every one of us is in a mortal state. Eventually, we will come to an end. Now, why is it important for us to remember that? Okay, to get ready. There's a day coming where we'll meet our maker. And while we may feel healthy, and while we may feel like, man, we're going to be here a long time, it's still important to recognize there's a time in which it comes to an end. As you and I look at our life, we have to realize there's times in our life when there are different festivities. If you're on top of the world tonight, recognize that's great. But guess what? It's not always going to be that way. If you're under the world tonight and feel like you have the pressure of everything on top of you, that's rough. But recognize there's a time coming when that, those things will pass away. Okay. So in addition to being born and dying, Solomon also says there is a time to plant and a time to pluck up or a time to prune, depending on how you want to put it. Okay, I ran across a saying here. I liked it. A successful farmer knows that nature works with him best when he works with nature. I like that saying that's right there. It's important for us to recognize sometimes plants have to go. Sometimes they have to come. A farmer has to recognize, okay, this year is a good year to rotate a crop into a different way. This year is a good year in order for us to plant trees. Okay? As you plant trees, there's a question. Am I going to be around when this tree grows, right? Rhonda and I, at around our place, we've been planting trees. And every tree I buy, I'm figuring up, okay, I'm 45. How old would this thing be if it ever makes a pecan, you know? Is this something I'll ever actually see, you know? Those sort of things. Well, you know, it's a, that's a calculation that every one of us makes as we go through to see how these things work. Now, talking about being born and dying. Is there a set time God has said, okay, that's it for this fella? It has happened. Sometimes it's just been your time, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to find in Scripture where it says, okay, God has decided you're done. Now, who was it that walked in the Old Testament with God until God plucked him up? Enoch. Enoch was a friend with God. God did not want him to die, so God took him home immediately. Same thing happened with Elijah as well. Remember the fire chariot? All right, you and I, remember one time Jesus is on the boat, and as the storm is coming and as different things happening, Jesus says, my time has not yet come. He's not quite that way for the rest of you. That's in the book of Luke. Some of us can hasten our deaths quicker than others, right? If you go to McDonald's too often, if you really enjoy skydiving, especially if you don't have parachutes, right? There's some people who are able to hasten their life and move it along quickly. I had a friend who preached with me in Mississippi many, many years ago, and um, he died in a very unfortunate way. There was a hurricane, and um, his TV antenna on top of the house fell over, and um, he decided that he needed to have TV. So 70, I think it was 73 mile an hour winds, he climbed on top of his house and picked up his TV antenna and it carried him like a kite into the electrical lines and that didn't go well for him. 
And um, I thought to myself, I hope when I die, it's a very boring way to go. Because that was a lot more excitement than I wanted to face. But sometimes we just don't make the best decision in the world. And so as you look at that, I'm, not, I'm with you, Webb. I'm not sure if God has written, okay, Mark is going to make it to this day. Now, God has foreknowledge, and he understands certain things. But I think God allows us to, with me, the choices we make in life, to expand life, shorten life with the decisions that we have. What do you all think? Okay, God has set the world in motion in many ways we make our decisions. He doesn't interfere and determine, okay, Mark's going to hit three red lights on the way to church tonight. Okay, Doug brings up a very good point. If it's not that way, how do you explain it to a family who's just lost a child? When a family loses a three-year-old, five-year-old child, a teenager in a car wreck, you don't say, well, hey, that was just God's will. All right? Not a wise thing to say. You don't say, well, God just needed an angel today, so he took your child. Okay? God allows things to happen, but God is not always in charge when it happens. He doesn't make it to happen. I guess is a good way to put that. Look at verse 3. There is a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. All right, there's some times in which you kill things. Um, if you had any form of meat, most likely, unless it was really weird meat, that thing was alive at one time, right? And you uh, learn very quickly if you're working on a farm or whatever. There's certain times you harvest different animals and such. I used to love growing up. Um, we would always have hogs or cattle or whatever, and we would always name the cows. We'd always name the pigs. Now, what I enjoyed about that was when I was sitting there at the table eating with my sister, I would say, you know, remember, this is, this is Elsie the cow. And she'd be like, I'm not eating it. And I'd be like, okay, that works, you know. Uh, you don't name the animals. Don't name the animals. Don't build that close relationship with them. But there's sometimes that death needs to happen. But there's also some times when healing needs to happen in our reactions to animals and things such as that. There's some times that you break down, sometimes that you build up. So as you talk about that, what is it that Solomon's after here? Sometimes you kill, sometimes you heal, sometimes you break down, sometimes you build up. Different phases in life, we're working on different things, aren't we? And if you go through the cliche method, all right, if you think of it as a cliche way, you're in your 20s, you've just married, late 20s, you're going to have your children. At that point, before the millennial era where it's so hard to afford a home, you know, you'd buy a house, you'd raise your children. Then later in life, you know, you'd do this or that or whatever else in those phases. Solomon's getting after. Notice each part of life, he says, there's something different that you do, something different that you look through, something different that you work on. And it's fascinating watching those things as it goes along and seeing how those things mean so much one way or the other. One thing that was interesting to me, as I was moving, I uh, was trying to sell a lot of my possessions here, I guess it was three weeks ago. Now every time on Facebook or the paper I see someone's having a garage sale, my heart just hurts for those people. Oh, bless their hearts, right? But it was fascinating to me that a lot of these things that, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago I thought I needed and, you know, I bought for this purpose or that purpose that meant so much. Here we are, you know, 10, 15, 20 years later, and I'm like, man, just somebody take it. Even if it's free, I'll almost pay you so I don't have to carry it anymore. We're in a different part of life, right? A different part of whatever it is we go through. I told Rhonda after we had been dating, I guess about a year or so, I said, I've been preaching for 25 years, and I've learned something whenever I've done weddings for older people. The guy never gets to keep his stuff. It's like the universal rule. 
And um, so maybe that's a little bit what's happened. Not too much, though. All right. Let's keep going. All right. There's a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Now, as you look in different commentaries, the point they make here, uh, this is what, verse 4, is the first part, the first duplet, the weeping and the laughing are considered to be private moments. The second part, the uh, mourning and the dancing, are the more public aspects of the same emotion. And so a lot of commentaries will spend a lot of time talking about those sort of things which are there. So as we look at that, there is a time when it's okay to cry, isn't it? And we have to give our, ourselves permission to grieve. Ourselves permission for times to hurt. And there's a grief class which is going on, and that's probably one of the things they're discussing quite a bit. But grief also is a private thing and a public thing. It's interesting how they did things in Old Testament days. How many days were you to mourn? How many days did they mourn over Moses? It's 40 days, if I'm not mistaken. You'd spend 40 days mourning over a husband, a child, a parent, especially a public figure. And then those period, that period of mourning would end. Well, why would that happen like that? It's trying to make it where at certain times you give yourself permission to live once again. You ever think about some of our funeral traditions and why we do funeral traditions the way that we do? Sometimes they're rooted in something. Sometimes I think we just do it for fun, that maybe they're not very well thought out. But at least in the southern part of this country, uh, someone will pass away, will wait a, you know, wait a day or two. Um, African-American culture, they usually wait a couple of weeks because somebody's got to come down from Chicago and pay for the funeral. Um, as far as our group, we don't do it quite that way. We'll wait a couple of days. And then we have a visitation. Why do we do the visitation? You ever thought about that? It's pretty hard for the family to stand there and shake everybody's hand or whatever else. Okay. It's a time for people to show how much they care and a time for that public outpouring of grief, which is there, all right? And also, it's a time for you to meet the world so that you don't have people coming by for the next three weeks or four weeks. And so part of the reason why we do the visitation the way we do is it's an opportunity for people to show that they're grieving with us, show that they appreciate us and the deceased, and to do that at one time, and so that the grieving process can continue. And that's one of the reasons why we do it that way. Is it the smartest way to do it? I don't know, because sometimes we really wear people out. And so I don't know if that's the best way or to do that or not. But there's a private time of mourning, and there's also a public time of mourning. Yes, ma'am, Marilyn? Yes. Right. Uh, she said a generation ago, a funeral was a very solemn occasion, and today it's more of a celebration of life. Yeah, if you know where you're going, there's a happiness to it. Right. And uh, there was a lot more mourning back in the Victorian period, um, you know, a generation or two ago, or even further back. It was more in style or in habit of the wearing black. You know, a lot of widows would wear black for sometimes years. And now in our culture, we, I don't know if we're scared of sadness or if we're just more comfortable, but a lot of times we go to a funeral and, you know, we'll tell stories about that person's life and we'll, we'll look at it in a much more positive way. They do. The trombones, they, uh, I forgot the French word for it, but they have a parade for people in New Orleans. That's right. Did you hear that? Bill says he wants to lead the parade for your funeral. 
<laughs> huh? Lewis says that's when everybody's going to be dancing. I might need to move back here to understand what you're saying. Lewis is dancing when? <laughs> Yes, that's the, that, that's the time to dance. That's right there. Okay, just making sure I get all this straight. I'm about to have to revise my Sunday morning lesson here. All right. Yes. What you got, Bob? That's right. That's when you see everybody is the funerals or weddings. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember I had a grandmother, and she would, as we were going through pictures, the way she'd identify whose funeral it was was who wasn't there. And uh, sometimes that's how family pictures go, you know. And so that, that's something you need to be careful about. It, for some reason, we're all too busy until that time comes. That's right. Mark, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, y'all remember the wakes where you would sit sit there? Yeah, it's creepy when you're a kid with a wake. That's right. It's changed very much since then. That's right. That, that's right. So you have that. All right, verse 5. There's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. All we'll say about this is oftentimes stones were used for farming. And sometimes they were used to prohibit somebody from farming as well. Okay. Going on with that, there's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Uh, society and culture teaches us sometimes it's good to hug, sometimes it's good not to hug. And it's very important for us to recognize the difference with those sort of things. Okay. There's times where you gain, times when you lose. As the great theologian Kenny Rogers would say, you got to know when to hold them and know when to what? Hold them. All right, good. See, we're going back to our old songs, The Birds and Kenny Rogers. Man, all right. Well, there's a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. Kenny Rogers? Throw away. Yes, 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 that's true. That's true. You learn that there's some times when things aren't as important as you thought they were to start with. That's when the yard sale comes in. That's right. And, you know, it, we're not just talking about stuff. Sometimes it's arguments. Sometimes it's some sort of belief that maybe doesn't go with Scripture, but it's just something we've always done a certain way. Those are some important things there. Okay. There's a time to rip and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, all right? The idea of ripping and sowing oftentimes refers to public mourning in the Bible days. That's something interesting to look at there. A time to keep silence may be the hardest thing to do, right? Do any of y'all ever have trouble being quiet? I do. I tell y'all a lot of times halfway joking the reason I became a preacher is I like to talk in church too much and I found me a job where I'm allowed to talk in church but it is hard when you have a closely held opinion it is hard when you think you know you're right or when you know you know you're right to not just tell everybody in the world about it do you ever have that issue think about a young man named Joseph he had a dream, right? First dream, all the sheaves bowed down. Next dream, all the cows and all that sort of thing, or the, st the stars and the moon and the sun, okay? Was it wrong for him to have that dream? No. But did he really need to go tell his brothers that God has just told me I'm going to rule over you soon? That was probably not the best thing in the world he could have done, all right? Sometimes it's good to be silent. And sometimes when we're silent, the words we say have more meaning and they have more effect. Sometimes that's a lesson which is important. Yes, ma'am, Marilyn? That what? Yeah, the dreams were given by God. Absolutely they were given by God. Yeah, they were. 
to show Joseph. But boy, when he told everybody, it caused some family troubles. So that's a good thing to see. All right. All right, thank you for being here. Next week, we go to one of the neatest verses of the Bible. Right after this, God holds eternity in their heart. Pretty neat stuff. All right, thank you for being here.